Okay, let's get started with lecture 13b. And to start, we'll do the coding first this time, and we're gonna take a deeper look at the type one error rate. So let's go back to our examples from lecture 13a. So I encourage you to have those notes in front of you so you can revisit those problems. And so in lecture 13a, we started with a problem where we lost 11 coin tosses in a row. And so we had to come up with, you know, at the end of the day, do you really think that the NFL has some vendetta against the Cleveland Browns that they are preventing them from winning coin tosses? Probably not. They've got the deck stacked against them enough, so we don't need to have rig the coin tosses to make them lose those two. But the problem is, it's just going to happen by chance that we still lose all 11 of them. And that's probably what we saw in reality back in the 2011 season. So let's illustrate that with a Monte Carlo simulation. So I'm going to simulate, uh, let's do 5,000 NFL seasons. And I'm going to simulate just the first 11 games of each season. So we have a situation that looks like what we had in the example we talked about previously. So what we're going to do with these two different ends is we're going to repeat 11 game seasons 5,000 times or 11 coin tosses 5,000 times. And so remember, whenever you are conducting a hypothesis test, you have to assume that the true proportion is what you have in the null hypothesis. So our null hypothesis was that the probability was 50%. So that's what we're going to store as the true P when we generate our data. So I have my Monte Carlo simulations. I have N. I have P and what I'm going to do is I'm going to store my results of the coin tosses. So rep N A and N C. So each time I flip the coin, uh, I'm sorry, each time I flip 11 coins, I'm going to count how many times they won the coin toss and store that in results. So let's see, this is a quick, pretty quick for loop we need to write here from I to one, from one to 5,000 we can store the results in, remember we can use our binome to generate Bernoulli's. If I do our binome one at a time with 11 coin tosses and a probability of P, this is going to look like, this is gonna look like the number of times they won out of 11. So what I'm simulating here, if I did it the other way, n comma one comma p, this will be all 11 games where a one is a win and a zero is a loss. So you can do it either way, but why don't we just skip a step here and simulate it the other way so that we have just how many coin tosses they won in each individual season. So here's a season where they won seven out of 11. Here's one where they won six out of 11, and again six, and then four out of 11. So what we're gonna simulate here in the for loop is how many coin tosses directly they won every season. So we'll go ahead and run that and see what we get. So keep in mind that this P that I have there is 50%. The truth really is 50%. So is it possible that you lost all 11 coin tosses even when the probability is really 50%? So let's take a look at our results as in the histogram and see what they look like. And you can see that most of the time they won around five or six coin tosses, which seems realistic out of 11 if there's a 50% chance. You can see it looks like one time they won 10 or a couple times they won 10, and a couple times they did win zero. And I could even figure out for sure, I can say which results equals zero with the double equals. Oh, okay, and it turns out they never did, um, they never did win zero in our 5,000 simulations. How often did they win one coin toss? Um, in line 14, so if I run this, which results double equals one, it'll tell me which seasons they only won one out of 11 coin tosses. So in season 4,080 out of 5,000, they only won one coin toss. And then a couple seasons later in 4085, they only won one coin toss. How often did they win 10 of them? Here's the seasons where they won 10 out of the 11 coin tosses. And how about winning all 11 of them? There's one season, 4099, where they won all 11 coin tosses. Now keep in mind, that's pretty improbable, right? Because you saw me simulate the data based on 50% being the true proportion. So the problem is, if I have a hypothesis test that I'm doing here, I'm gonna reject my null hypothesis. I'm gonna reject it incorrectly then sometimes because I said here, and you saw that the probability really is 50%. So I think the rule that we chose in lecture 13a was we're going to reject our null hypothesis if we win two or fewer coin tosses. If we win two or fewer coin tosses, to me that's strong enough evidence that the proportion is actually less than 50%. And you can see that how often is results less than or equal to two. 
2.88% of the time. So I can do results less than or equal to two. And we've seen this before with the confidence interval coverage, right? It'll give me a true or false everywhere that that is correct. So here's the season, 932, three, four, five. Season 936, they won two or fewer, less than or equal to two. And so 2.88% of the time, they won two or fewer coin tosses. Now we just said that was gonna be our rejection rule. So it turns out 2.88% of the time, we are going to reject the hypothesis, even though the truth really is 50%. That is a type one error that we have just made there. So what I was trying to get at in the last lecture as well is just picking, well, we're gonna reject when we win two or fewer. That's not a good way to choose a rejection criterion. What we wanna do instead is choose the type one error rate that we are willing to tolerate and then work backwards and figure out what that means for a rejection rule. So in this case, if I pick an arbitrary rule winning two or fewer games, it leads me to a type one error rate. So this would be the alpha down here of about 2.88%. And that's not terrible. I'm willing to put up with that, but do you really think that the NFL is rigging coin tosses? Probably not. So alpha has to be different for different problems. So let's revisit then example two with the platelets in your blood. And so here's lecture 13. And just to remind you, here's the problem. You should have these notes in front of you. Double check that I have that third observation. It should be 375, not 275. And I think I uploaded the notes maybe with a wrong number there. And so here's the situation we had. We should have a normal distribution with a mean of 250. And so we formulated our hypotheses that the true mean was equal to 250 versus the alternative that the mean was greater than 250. How do we choose a rejection rule? Well, we don't want to do what we just did in the Browns example. We want to calibrate the type one error rate to what we want it to be and then work from there and see what the rejection rule is. So let's calibrate our type one error rate to be alpha equals 1% and see what that means for the rejection rule. And what we saw again then was, well, I'm hypothesizing about mu, right? So it should stand to reason that I'm going to use X bar, an unbiased estimator, to build my test to build my test statistic, which is going to be what I use to actually compute the hypothesis test. So if I'm doing a hypothesis on mu, that's why I use my standardized X bar and I know the sampling distribution. So there's two good reasons to use X bar here. Number one, it's unbiased for mu. Number two, I can know exactly what that sampling distribution will be under the assumptions that I've made. So I know that x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n is gonna follow a t minus one. Calibrating my type one error rate at 1% is gonna imply the rejection rule from that. And because I have a t n minus one for my sampling distribution, that means I need to find the 99th percentile of my t distribution. And as I said before, I encourage you to draw a quick picture here. Um, where's my marker? Uh oh. So when you draw your picture, look to your alternative hypothesis to see which side your rejection region is going to be on. Oops, I guess they have here. And so because my alternative is that the mean is greater than 250, then I'm looking for evidence on the greater than side for where I'm going to reject. So the question is then, where did my rejection region actually begin there? I kind of drew it arbitrarily in the picture, but if I want to have my alpha be 0.01, then I have 1% on this side of the rejection region and then 99% over here. So that means if I've got 99, 99% to the left of that rejection region, I need the 99th percentile of my T n minus one here. So that's why I have the QT 99.6. And that tells me that that line that I drew in my picture is at 3.143. That's my rejection rule. So you can see how that would be kind of hard to come up with on your own. Well, let's suppose in my blood platelets example, we reject if we observe a T statistic of greater than 3.143. Where are you going to come up with that? Well, it turns out if you work backwards from the type 1 error rate, that's where you get that number. So 
what we found out then is that we're going to reject our null hypothesis when we have greater than 3.143. So let's come back to our simulation study. Example one, one platelets. Um, I'll call the Brown's example, example zero. And so here's our blood platelets example. And so what we need to do here is n was equal to seven, right? I'm gonna simulate data and see how often we incorrectly reject a null hypothesis. It should be 1% of the time based on how I've calibrated our type one error rate here. So I'll have my n equals seven, mu was 250. Remember when you're hypothesis testing, you are assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So we're assuming that mu is 250 and working from there. And sigma, um, I didn't give you this in the original problem, remember, because we used S instead. We need to have a true variance to simulate, and so I'll make it be 80 here, just for the sake of illustration. So I just made that number up for this lecture. We didn't use that at all in lecture 13A. And then I need to store my T statistics, T observation storage equals rep NA and MC, where we had 5,000 MC. So let's generate our data. Platelets equals R norm. Why am I using norm? Because remember from lecture 13a, we had the assumption that the average count of platelets is normally distributed with a mean of 250. I should have said in there, okay, yeah, the standard deviation is 80 as well, but um, I wasn't thinking ahead far enough. So we'll make that assumption here in this example too. So the normal that we have a normal distribution for the data and we talked about that last week so that's why i'm using our norm here i need to generate seven observations at a time with a mu of 250 and the standard deviation of sigma so my seven my 250 and my 80 are all going to be plugged into there because of the way i call the variables in lines 23 through 25 up here so there's my data that's going to simulate a sample every time right and then I need to compute my observed t statistic, which is x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. So x bar is the mean of my platelet sample. Um, s is going to be the standard deviation of my sample. And so then my t statistic, t observed, remember I call it observed because it's based on my observed data, the x bar and the s, is going to be x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. And remember, all these have values stored in them, so that'll be fine. So this is my observed T statistic, and then I need to store it. Okay, so what is going to happen when I do this then? Let's look at a histogram of my T observed storage. And it looks kind of weird, but what kind of distribution is that? It turns out that is a T6 distribution because that's what my, under the null hypothesis, remember, uh, I didn't write it, but um, I have it right here, don't I? Under the null hypothesis distribution, x bar minus mu over s over square root of n, which is what I just computed, follows a tn minus 1. So when we plot all of our, where did that come from? When we plot all of our t observed, this is what it looks like. And it turns out, if I do a histogram of rt for random t samples, let's just look at lots of t6s. This is what a T6 really looks like. So you can see how my observed T kind of looks like that, and that's not a coincidence. So more importantly, how often do I make a type one error? So let's uh, figure out then how often is my T observed storage greater than 3.143 was my cutoff rule, my rejection rule, correct? Yeah, because that was the 99th percentile of the T6. So how often am I beyond 3.143? Uh, 1.12% of the time. Now, is that number a coincidence that we got there? Remember, we very specifically and carefully chose that 3.143 so that we would make a type 1 error 1% of the time. And you can see in my Monte Carlo simulation, that's pretty darn close to what's happening. So I feel good that we've calibrated the type 1 error correctly. And it, it wasn't interesting that that happened. I think it's interesting, but I mean, I'm a statistician. Um, that sigma equals 80 didn't change that. I could redo it and have sigma equal 90 instead, and I bet we still get our type 1 error rate to be right about 1%. 0.88%, that's a little low, but remember there's some randomness involved in here. We're still pretty darn close to 1%.
I'm going to change it back to 80 just so we have it what we had before. But the point is that 3.143 is a very specifically and very carefully chosen rejection region based on the type 1 error rate. And remember, I got that from QT of the 99th percentile from an N minus 1. And so that is from the T6 distribution. That told me where to specifically cut off and reject the null hypothesis. If I observe an X bar minus mu over S over the square root of N beyond that 3.143, I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis. And on long-term behavior, 1% of the time, that's gonna happen just by chance, even when the true mu really is 250, as you saw me create up here in line 24. So one more example of this type one error rate for this video. And what was our last problem from 13A? was about blood types. So we had 40 patients and we were testing whether the true probability that we had a positive blood type was really 50% or not. And so we wanted a type one error rate of 5%, which is why we said alpha equals 0.05. So let's see if we can really replicate that with our simulation study. Three blood types. And so how did we do this? So now I need N was 40, I believe. P will go back to 50% like it was for the Browns example because we're testing the same hypothesis, right? That the true probability is 50%. And so I'll need to store my Z statistics. Remember, why am I using Z and not T now? It's because of my sampling distribution of the test statistic. I have a large enough sample, and I'm not using S. Remember, S is used in conjunction with the T distribution. Um, when I'm using the CLT here, that's the central limit theorem is about a normal distribution. So I'm using the central limit theorem here as my sampling distribution. And so that's why I'm using the normal and not the T in this case. So I'm gonna store Z observed and not T observed. Where was the cutoff gonna be? Um, let's just be careful and draw the picture again because I really want to encourage you to do that when you're choosing the rejection region. My, um, what was my hypothesis? That P is less than 50%. So when I draw my picture, I am focusing evidence that's going to cause me to reject the null will be then on the left side of my sample distribution. So let's just sketch that real quick. So because my alternative hypothesis was that the probability is less than 50%, then that's gonna be the direction where there's evidence against the null or evidence for the uh, alternative hypothesis. So I kind of drew that line there to cut it in half, or not cut it in half, but specifically cut it into 5% and 95% because of my alpha level. So in this case, also be careful because when you do your rejection region, we use Q norm. Oh, see, I wrote it wrong in the notes here. Sorry. I have Q norm 0.01, but it should have been 0.05 based on the way I did it there. Let me double check that. Yeah, okay. Whoops. So there's a mistake in lecture 13A. Sorry about that. So um, it looks like I have the correct number because Q norm 0.0501 is the negative 1.644. So this part's correct, but this should say 0.05. I'll uh, make a note of that. Sorry about that. So um, keep in mind, why did I use 0.05 here and not 0.95 like I did in the previous example? Because the Q function in R always gives you the left side of things. So because my left side is 5%, I can just use that directly in the Q norm function. So my rejection region then is Q norm 0 0.05, standard normal 0, 01, so negative 1.644. So let's simulate and see how often my test statistic is to the left of negative 1.644, which would cause me to reject my null. So one to NMC. So let's simulate some blood types, R binome 
uh, 1 and p. And so under the null hypothesis, when p is truly 50% with 40 people, it turned out in this one I just did 20 people were positive. That's exactly what we expected it to be, right? So this particular example I just simulated is going to be evidence very much in support of, of the null hypothesis because it is exactly 50% is what I got from that simulation. So I still need to compute then my p hat will be sum of types divided by n. That's just x bar in disguise, right? Which is why we can apply the central limit theorem uh, to the sampling distribution here. I forgot to run n equals 40 there. That's why that didn't say 50%. So there's my p hat, then my z observed is going to be x bar or p hat minus the true p divided by the square root of p times one minus p divided by n. All this is the central limit theorem it's showing up again. And then I'm gonna store that z observed storage equals my z observed. And I need to store that with the square brackets in pi. Okay, so let's simulate and see what we get. Let's look at a histogram of my z observed storage. And it kind of looks like a standard normal, right? You can see there's a little bit of a gap in there, so it's not perfect. Remember, the central limit theorem is perfect when I have an infinitely large sample size. I don't have that here. I only have 40 observations. So that's why we don't quite see the perfect normal distribution. But more importantly for this exercise, what's my type 1 error rate? How often do I get a z observed storage that's in my rejection region? And mathematically here, that means less than, what was it, negative 1.64. Four, eight. And it turns out then I get a type 1 error right there. Oh gosh, did I freeze R? Um, I think I might have frozen R. Hang oh, no, there we go. Um, that doesn't look right though. Let me try this again. Did I spell storage wrong or something? It was my mistake. Some of you are screaming at your screens right now, I'm sure. You see exactly what I did wrong. Oh, here's what I'm doing wrong. Um, I did less than negative there. And it turns out that little arrow symbol is how you create a variable. See, I even did the exact same thing when I rehearsed this. Sorry. So yeah, this is a weird one. So what I'm actually doing here is storing 1.6448 in the z observed storage instead of testing to see less than negative there. So why don't I put this whole thing in parentheses and try this again. So I'm not inadvertently creating a new variable. There we go. So now I'm actually checking to see how often is z observed storage less than negative 1.6448. And it turns out here it's 3.8%. We were supposed to have a type 1 error rate of 5%, right? So it's not perfect here. And why is it not perfect here? Because we're using the central limit theorem as an approximation. And so it doesn't do terribly here. You know, we're off by what, 1.2%. But I want to emphasize that the central limit theorem, it's great and widely applicable. But with sample size of 40 here, it's failed us a little bit, you know, by 1.2% for my type 1 error rate. So hopefully that clarifies type one error rate a little bit and how we choose the rejection region. Go through and make sure you know every line of code what's really happening here. Reach out to us if you have any questions about that.